Good morning, everyone. So I'm very happy to be here and to be able to share some of my ideas. And I understand that the main theme of this meeting is new ideas for the future and the marble game. So I'd like to combine these two. Uh, so my talk will revolve around two most important challenges that lie ahead of the astronomy of fundamental physics and our understanding of the universe. But before I go to, the, to describing these two challenges, I'm going to tell you a little bit how I see the process of understanding the universe, of getting to know the universe. So let's imagine that we find ourselves in a dark hall. Yes, we come to a dark hall, we open our eyes, we start looking around, our eyes adjust to the darkness, and we start seeing shapes. We see a table, and we walk to that table, we start to look around and sense how it looks. Uh, there is a chair, we sit on the chair, we uh, look on the table, and there is a matchbox. We light a match, we look around, there are a few more chairs, there is a flashlight on one of them, I take the flashlight, I look around, I see that there are many more tables in this hall, and then I start thinking, how large is the hall? How can I measure the size of it? Whether the tables that I see are really tables that are there, or maybe I see reflections in the mirrors that are on the walls of that hall. So then, you know, I form a hypothesis, and then I try to verify it somehow. The other uh, way to the other uh, example of how we look at the universe is if we try to make a theory of solids. You take a piece of ice, you heat it, it melts, you have some water, then you heat it even more, water evaporates, and then you have a theory, all the solids will melt, uh, uh, then evaporate. Then you take a piece of wood, you start to heat it, and it doesn't melt, it will burn. So now you have to make a new theory that takes into account both of these facts. So it's in making physical theories, you have to keep on verifying, verifying the ideas that you have at new, uh, new and separate conditions. So let me go back to uh, the main theme of this talk, namely the uh, ideas for the future and uh, the dark hole. So let's start with uh, a marble. I have a marble now. Now if I throw the marble up and it comes down, and we all know that this is because of gravity. And the beautiful idea of Newton combined the fact that you can describe the motion of the marble or an apple falling on his head with the same law that describes the motion of the moon around the earth. And by measuring the motion of the marble or an apple or and the moon, you can measure the mass of the earth. You can also extend this idea further, measure the motion of the planets in our solar system, and by measuring the motion of the planets in our solar system, you can measure the mass of the sun. And it all works beautifully, but then you go further, and you, the, the next huge object in our local universe is the galaxy, the Milky Way. You can measure the motion of all the stars in the galaxy, and the stars, and this will tell you some idea about the mass of the galaxy. And then you can count the stars. You can look in the sky and count all the stars in the galaxy, and also measure or estimate the mass of the galaxy. And here comes a surprise, the first surprise, that the mass estimated from counting the stars is about 10 times smaller than the mass that you estimate by looking at the motion uh, of the stars. So what could be the solution? The solution is that either the law of gravity is different at very large distances, and there are several attempts to formulate theories like that, and the other solution is that there is a lot of matter, dark matter, that exerts gravity but doesn't emit any light. So the first challenge is, what is the dark matter? Is there really dark matter? And if there is dark matter, what particles cons it consists of and how to find it, how to detect it? Now, the second challenge 
in order to understand the second challenge, we have to go back to my dark hole analogy. Let's imagine we sit at this table and there is a lamp on the table. We uh, look at the lamp uh, and it has a bulb like this. It's a standard bulb, we know how bright it is. And we see that other tables also have lamps and these lamps shine up every now and then randomly so we can measure the apparent brightness of each lamp at each table and by measuring that we can estimate the distances and map the distribution of tables in that big hall. Now this is exactly what has been happening with the uh, investigation of the universe. Tables are analogs of galaxies and there are sources that we know uh, very well and that have uh, particular brightness, we can measure them, and by measuring them, we can estimate the distances to uh, galaxies farther and farther away. Now, <coughs> uh, we, th th as this has been done, the other thing has also been found, that the farther the galaxies are from us, the faster they move away from us. So the universe as a whole is expanding. And then, the, and then the obvious expectation is that because of gravity, the rate of expansion should be slowing down. Yes, because each galaxy is pulled uh, by other galaxies, so there is some force that counteracts the expansion. And yet, about 20 years ago, uh, two teams of astronomers have found that the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating its expansion. So there is something that pushes the universe uh, out. There is some additional force, some additional interaction that makes the universe uh, expand faster and faster. Now, what could that be? The main idea how to explain this goes back to Albert Einstein, who introduced something called the cosmological constant into his equations. And I'm not going to tell you what the cosmological constant is, but it can be explained by something called dark energy. And dark energy is a substance that fills the universe and has the very special properties of exerting negative gravity. So it pushes out the universe. And, we, we, and just as we required uh, that there is at least 10 times more dark matter than the ordinary matter, now we require that there is at least 30 times more dark energy than the ordinary matter. By ordinary matter, I mean this, the matter like I am made of, like you are made of, like the Earth, the Sun, the matter that we see around us uh, in the universe. So, we have a universe which is uh, where, for, where there is 40 times more matter that we don't see and there is only one part of the matter that we do see. <clears throat> so, uh, now the, the next point is how to solve it, how to find what is the uh, dark energy, how to identify its properties, <coughs> and how to identify the... Um, properties of dark matter. So dark energy is the second challenge that I'm going to talk about. Now, in order to solve such challenges, as always in science, you need to do experiments, you need to do observations, and you need to have new ideas. Now, these new ideas have to be come either from experiments or uh, have to be driven by uh, other theories that could be verified by experiments. So I'm going to tell you now about two experiments that I'm involved in and that may shed a light over the next decades on these two most important challenges. One is uh, that in order, so the first challenge was dark matter. In order to identify dark matter, find what dark matter is, we really have to, we, we, we assume that <coughs> the dark matter is not actually dark. The dark matter emits some tiny, tiny light. And in order to see this light, which should be 
uh, photons at very high energies, we have to build special observatories that will be able to watch the universe and watch these parts of the universe where dark matter is at its densest. And dark matter is at its densest at centers of dwarf galaxies, centers of small galaxies that lie <coughs> around us. Now, the observatory that can fulfill this task is called the Cherenkov Telescope Array, and I have been involved for the past 10 years uh, in uh, preparation for the construction of this observatory. Now, uh, the two sites in, are chosen. One is in the southern hemisphere, another is in the northern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere site will, will have the size of about 10 kilometers squared and will comprise of 100 independent telescopes in the north. In the Canary Islands, it's smaller. It's, a, it's on the size of about half a kilometer squared with about 20 telescopes. These observatories will start working in about 20... 23, so in the next five or so years. And by that time, we'll start understanding and hopefully we'll see what dark matter is. So in the dark hole analogy, this amounts to trying to detect tiny, tiny uh, blue LED lights that are placed at each table and that should be shining and should indicate something additional that happens in local galaxies. The second challenge, <coughs> is the dark energy. In order to understand the dark energy, we have to map the universe and map the expansion of the universe. So a tool that can help doing this is gravitational wave astronomy. This is the new branch astronomy that Pavel mentioned that was started in 2015 by observations of black hole collisions with LIGO and Virgo. And LIGO or Virgo are very big uh, inter gravitational wave observatories. They are about three to four kilometers by three to four kilometers large. Uh, Virgo is located in Italy in Pisa. LIGO detectors are located in the US. And they allow to observe black hole collisions in the local universe. And the black hole collisions have these very nice properties that they are standard candles. When we see a black hole collision, we know how bright it should be, it, how bright it was, and we can measure the distance to, to, to that uh, particular uh, collision. So they allow us to map the universe, to make a map of this dark hole that we found ourselves in. Uh, as I said, LIGO and Virgo will not be able to observe the entire universe. However, I am now working with a group of people who are designing and uh, working on constructing a next generation gravitational wave observatory called Einstein Telescope, which is going to be a 10 by 10 kilometer facility located underground to minimize all the noises. And Einstein Telescope should be able to see black hole collisions in the entire universe between us and the Big Bang. So with this facility, which should be operational in about 20 years, we should be able to map the entire universe. And when we map the entire universe, we should be able to uh, determine how the density of dark energy has been evolving through the history, through the age of the universe, when the dark energy has appeared, how it appeared, and what is going to, and we can then uh, think what's going to happen with dark energy in the next one, two, or 10 billion of years. So to sum it up, we find ourselves in a universe where 95% <coughs> of the matter is something that we don't know. So let's look at this marble, and you see, or maybe not, not very clearly, this is a glass marble with some uh, colored glass inside. We essentially know, well, let's assume that this um, gl colored glass represents the matter that we know something about. Now, if we drop it into here, this is my model of the universe. We know only about the matter that is colored inside. We don't know anything about dark, ma dark matter, which is the glass around the colored glass, 
And then there is the dark energy, which fills the rest of the universe. So essentially, our current knowledge is extremely limited to a very small part of the universe around us. And this reminds me of the state of physics in 19th century. In 19th century, people's, physicists thought that physics is basically clear, everything was already found. The only problem was that the universe was supposed to be filled with ether, which was this mysterious substance that was supposed to carry electromagnetic waves. Then there came experiments that proved that there is no ether, and that led to a revolution in physics, formulation of general theory of relativity, general theory of relativity, and quantum physics. Now, I think that today and in the coming decades, we stand <coughs> in the similar point. We have these challenges that we assume that the universe is filled with mysterious substances that we don't know anything about. We try to find, them, find out what they are. We try to find out their properties. But when we find them, I believe that what we will really face will be another revolution in physics, like the one that happened 120 years ago, and that our understanding of the universe will be much different than it is now. Thank you.